War is ripping the world apart again. Airstrikes and mass graves are back in the news. Nuclear powers are on the battlefield. It's a tense time for the international community. In the US, Donald Trump is leading an isolationist campaign. His foreign policy rhetoric has spooked allies in Europe. In Asia, conflict is brewing. China's belligerence has turned the South China Sea into a powder keg. And in Africa, military juntas are on the march. Has the peace dividend of the last century ended? Can India's balancing diplomacy be the answer to modern conflicts? In this session, we are being joined by Ehud Olmert. Ehud Olmert is the former Prime Minister of Israel. He led the country during the 2006 war with Lebanon. He has also been elected twice as the Mayor of Jerusalem. Dumart Oturbaev is the former Prime Minister of the Kyrgyz Republic. He has also worked as a senior policy advisor in the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. Moderating this session is Palki Sharma, the managing editor of First Post. Thank you. Through the day we've discussed how to prepare our countries better for the wars that will follow. I think it's only fair that we end the evening by discussing how to prevent those wars in the first place and how to end the ones that are already on. Uh, gentlemen, it's very nice to have both of you uh, and we hope you can share the wealth of your experience uh, with our audience here and those who are watching us uh, online. Let me start with you, uh, Mr. Oturbaev. A lot of people talk about the peace dividend, uh, how countries can make the most of the peace that follows long wars. And uh, after the 20th century, after the end of the Cold War, we thought the world had a shot at it. But the last few years, uh, the kind of developments that we've seen uh, have shattered that belief. Would you say the peace dividend is over? Uh, first of all, uh, my congratulations with excellent organization and uh, level of participants bring this conference to complete success. Uh, I personally learn a lot. It's quite an interesting subject. On the issue which you raised about conflicts, uh, I would like to make a side of the great uh, philosopher Franz Kafka who said famously that all talks are meaningless if there's a lack of trust. So we all have to think what we have to do early in the morning, standing up, how to contribute on building trust everywhere, in our family, in our nation, with our neighbors, all over the world. Little step by step, trying to build trust. Very difficult, absolutely, but we live in a very small planet which can be destroyed very easily for many times. So my advice that we must do everything, every day, to try to build trust in all over the world. That's very sound advice, I would say, and I will come to the point of trust and how we can build it. But let me um, uh, ask this to uh, Mr. Ehud Olmert as well. Uh, Israel was on the brink of that dividend. You know, we've seen the Abraham Accords and the normalization uh, uh, deals that Israel signed with various Arab countries. And then on October 7th last year, you saw the Hamas attack. And it seems to have shattered... Uh, the peace dividend that Israel could have reaped after all these years of conflict, do you think that you still have a shot at making those relationships work? I join in with uh, Prime Minister thanking you for inviting us and uh, for providing us with an opportunity to uh, learn a little bit about the uh, horizons 
uh, of uh, one of the most important powers in the world today, which uh, we are not necessarily familiar with on a daily basis, in where we live and we have to tackle with our problems. Um, I think that uh, I want to um, support uh, the Prime Minister in saying that trust is very important. Trust is fundamental. Trust is the beginning. Uh, we, we missed uh, an opportunity as a result, of course, of the uh, uh, vicious attack of the uh, Hamas, which was unsolicited. There was no confrontation, no exchange of hostilities or violence in the border. And in fact, as you probably all know, in already 2005, I was privileged to be a vice prime minister in the Israeli government, which pulled out completely from Gaza. So we pulled out completely from Gaza. We don't occupy one centimeter in Gaza. It's different in the West Bank. It's a different story. But in Gaza, we didn't occupy one centimeter. And the day after we pulled out, they already started to shoot rockets on Israeli uh, townships across the border, and it didn't stop until the 7th of October when Israeli finally decided to counter offensive in a very massive manner, in a very massive manner, and there is no question about it. I think that there was an historic uh, opportunity in 2008, uh, beginning of 2009, to resolve the historical conflict between us and the Palestinians, which is the basis for everything that will develop in the Middle East. Uh, and this was when I presented as the Prime Minister of Israel to the President of the Palestinian Authority, uh, Mahmoud Abbas, uh, or as he is known also as Abu Mazen, uh, a peace plan on the basis of a two-state solution. This was presented to the Palestinians at the end of 2008, beginning of 2009, officially by the Prime Minister of the State of Israel on behalf of the State of Israel. And it was the maximum that then or since then or in any time in the future the Palestinians will be able to get within the framework of an agreement. It was a two-state solution on the basis of 67 borders with Jerusalem, the Arab side of Jerusalem, as the capital of the Palestinian state, and also with the Holy Basin, which is where the most important and uh, holy places for three religions, the, um, the Jewish old city, and the, uh, which is very important for us, the uh, Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which is very important for the Christians, and the Temple Mount, which is extremely important uh, also uh, because of the uh, Alaska, Alaska Mosque for the Muslims, would have been administered by an international trust of five nations without any political, exclusive political sovereignty for any country. Which means that Israel would have given up its exclusive sovereignty, which is existing now, for the sake of achieving uh, an understanding about the sacred places for all the different religions. And the fourth thing was that the refugee issue, which was hanging over the skies of the Middle East for so many years, would have been resolved within the framework of the Arab League Peace Initiative, which was originally accepted by the Arabs uh, by the Arab League in 2002, the 28th of November 2002, and was reconfirmed on the 28th of November 2007 in Riyadh. This was presented to the Palestinians. They failed to say yes. Since then, there were ongoing confrontations. And now we have this terrible event which has shaken the foundations of the Middle East. How can we achieve peace? We can achieve peace if the Israeli leadership, and I have to make it very obvious, okay, for the sake of transparency. I don't speak for the state of Israel. I'm not a spokesman of the Israeli government. And I guess some of you who are familiar with the news know that I'm not a supporter of the Israeli government on the contrary. 
I'm in a very sharp opposition to the government. So I need to say, if the Israeli government will be willing to make the necessary compromises at the end of the day to allow the creation of a Palestinian state within a framework of an agreement between us and them, and if the Palestinians will have the courage and the leadership to come along. At the present time, the main obstacle for a comprehensive rearrangement of the entire Middle East is the lack of will on both sides. Well, those are some very big ifs that you have, uh, uh, that you have pointed out. Uh, and, and you both mentioned trust, I think, or the lack of it that leads to conflict. Uh, I could add one more point, and that is politics, which sometimes becomes the enemy of peace. Uh, um, even in the case of uh, the conflict in West Asia. But if we were to talk about building trust, uh, Mr. Otorbaev, uh, who is going to, to build that trust? Uh, you know, we, we set up, or the West set up, uh, multilateral institutions like the United Nations to do that job. But increasingly, countries uh, are not showing faith, and the UN is proving to be ineffective in resolving conflicts. Even in the case of Israel, Israel has questioned uh, the impartiality of the United Nations. So who is going to be that party that builds trust? Unfortunately, there are not good news on that question. Uh, we are facing the process of deglobalization which started quite efficiently after collapse of Soviet Union and collapse of Berlin Wall. At that time, humanity have enormous chance to, uh, m to make our Earth as friendship between different nations. So we lost this chance. What's going on is that world is divided very sharply, every day, every week. Uh, what we see now is that uh, so-called global south migrating out of the most important values of the Western civilization. Unfortunately, because I am personally is a Democrat, I, I like democracy, my country is a democratic country. But for some reasons, Western civilization were unable to attract the societies in the global south. So what's happening now that West remain isolating for very different reasons. Again, uh, because there is no dialogue, there is no listening, people not listening, insisting on which model is better, etc. Emerging of China is a major element of deglobalization. So United States is quite jealous. They are losing the influence all the world. Europe, unfortunately, do not do nothing in terms of bringing at least Eurasian continent to, to the terms of friendship and cooperation. They're just listening what people in another part of Atlantic are saying. This is unfortunately. And then this conflict today is exactly two years ago when Russia started its military operation. I don't know either intentionally or not you settle this day for today. So it's completely ruining security architecture around the world. The security architecture, which was constructed after the Second World War, collapsed. Actually, the name of the game in so-called Russia-Ukrainian negotiations have to be converted into process of building new security elements. On that way, I believe everybody will save face. We need to talk about this conflict between Ukraine and Russia when everybody will save face only. Maybe this is valid for Israeli-Palestinian conflict. How to save face? 
going around and talk about building new security architecture. No winners, no losers. We must reconsider in the 21st century what we should do jointly to build more fair world. Well, that's another, another discussion altogether because uh, the countries that sit at the high table that dictate the rules will not give up that power. Uh, so uh, I think we'll have to wait for some sort of reform. We talked about multilateral uh, institutions like the United Nations. The other is American leadership, uh, uh, Mr. Olmert. Um, and uh, we've seen U.S. leadership being questioned and challenged, and uh, we've seen it failing uh, in Gaza, in Afghanistan, uh, in, in Ukraine. Uh, what do countries like Israel then do? Do they, do they look for other allies? Or do they wait for America to get its act together? And this is an America that is heading into an election uh, with the possibility of Donald Trump being on the, on, on the ballot, uh, the man who talks about walking out of multilateral engagements. Uh, what, what option? I mean, who is going to reinforce or enforce that, that security apparatus? I must say that you must have a great sense of humor. Uh, which I, I admire, you know, when you ask me whether America will uh, put its act together and immediately afterwards you say and Donald Trump will become president of America. This is putting its act on reverse and endangering the stability of the entire world. So if the first thing that I can wish for America is that uh, if the choice is between Biden and Trump, you know, I think <laughs> you all understand what is good for America. Good for America is to have someone who may not have necessarily all the energies that we expect from someone who is the President of the United States. But thank God he doesn't have the energies that the other one has. Uh, anyway, uh, I can't complain about America on the, on the country. I must say, I personally know uh, Joe Biden very well. I've worked with him for a long time in different capacities of his and mine. And I think that he has manifested a, a remarkable degree of support for the state of Israel, but also support for what I think is essential, and this is an attempt to build up a new axis in the Middle East, which is comprised by, by the partners to the Abraham Accords, the Emirates, Israel, and uh, Bahrain, and potentially Sudan, and the other North African countries, and also the normalization between Israel and Saudi Arabia, that together with uh, Egypt and with Jordan, and with a Palestinian state will create a new, stable, strong uh, partnership, together with America, of course, that will be very significant in, in the light or in the darkness of the endless attempts by uh, Iran to upset the balance in our part of the world. So uh, one can't really uh, blame the American president for the lack of initiative. He started these efforts before October. Uh, I think what is absolutely clear at this point for all of the uh, parties involved, and I think I can speak with a certain authority since I dealt with it all my political life, the enemy of peace in the Middle East at the present time are the radical Islamic forces. The Hamas, the Islamic Jihad, and the inspirators, which are the Iranians. So I think that strategically, the Western forces, led by the United States of America, with participation of the Europeans, and by the way, the Europeans and the British and the French and the Germans were very productive in the efforts that they made in the last few months together with America to, on the one side, to support the state of Israel and to oppose the radical forces Hamas and Jihad, and at the same time, 
to try and create a certain momentum, towards a certain momentum, hopefully, that will require maybe some political pressures on Israel as well, to rid ourselves of the rage which has definitely influenced us for good reasons as a result of the atrocious attacks against us uh, in uh, October, in order to build up what we want, which is this new axis of uh, the uh, moderate Arab countries, together with America and the State of Israel, which will make uh, a big difference. So I don't think that one can say that America has failed completely. On the other hand, it is very difficult to run this new um, uh, process when on the other side you have quite an aggressive and uh, um, unfriendly uh, Russian uh, government and quite an aggressive uh, Iranian radical government and uh, uh, China which is playing in order to make the most for China at the expense of all the stability that we are trying to achieve. Mr. Uh, Otorbayev, let's talk about choices. The global system was founded on the belief that every country has the right to make a sovereign choice. But increasingly, we see that when countries make choices, it ends in a war. Ukraine chose the West and Russia invaded. Israel chose normalization with Arab states and Hamas attacked. So are countries making wrong choices or is the global system failing to guarantee their right to make that choice? Uh, war existed in our planet all along the history. Uh, so you always can analyze the history and draw lessons from it. Nobody drawing lessons from the past. Uh, uh, as uh, Karl Marx used to say, the politics is expression of economic development. So one sorts of countries getting more influential, and your country is getting more influential. Now we're talking about your own military industrial complex, which is natural. And some neighbors said, no, this is not. You, you should not be militarized. Huh? Uh, so it's always will be disagreements in, 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 in navigating to the, uh, of changing the world. If China would be the same as it was 40 years ago, there would not be deglobalization. Nobody would be introducing tariffs and import taxes and build military capacities. But that is happening. It's like elephant entering the eleva elevator when few people are already quite tense, and then elephant entering. What can you do with that? Elephant must also be going with you with the elevator. So you have to negotiate. Huh? Let's do it step by step, whatever. So this economic development, reorganization of overall uh, political economic landscape around the world is dictating disagreements between nations. Uh, my practical advice uh, uh, would be that we are also Asians. When I go into any time, any kind, in any country in Asia, any nation, I find a lot of similarities. Either it's uh, uh, Arabs, Japanese, Chinese or Indians, we know, for example, when we enter in the room where we have to sit perfectly, right? So it's kind of Asian values. We can start building peace on our continent. It is possible. What we have in now, for instance, we had Indonesia, we have elections over there, democratic country will face elections here in India than in many other places, in Russia, also part of, biggest part of Russia is in Asian continent. So we can try to apply our common wisdom as Asian values to build 
certain peace in our continent. In about 50, uh, 20 years, uh, the, more than 50% of world GDP will be produced in our continent. What does it mean? We become bigger and we become more powerful economically as well as politically. So somebody should say, okay, uh, we will get you some kind of shares in, in, in voting, whatever. World Bank, IMF, they don't want us to enter to the board rooms, neither to China nor India. Strange, but what's happening that we will build our own institutions. So in that respect, changing of economic landscape of the world should be reflected in political reforms. But nobody is listening, as I started in the beginning. Everybody must learn out of their own mistakes. Again, I have to say very sound advice, uh, not just for countries, for individuals as well. Um, Mr. Olmert, you've seen different types of global order. Um, towards the end of the Cold War, you were a cabinet minister. Uh, during the period of American uni unilateralism, you were the Prime Minister of Israel, and now you're an observer when we have an emerging multipolar world. According to you, which was better or which is better for conflict resolution and containment? Having two superpowers, having one superpower, or having multiple powers? This is a very complex issue. I remember that uh, interesting, in, in comparison to the present circumstances, I was talking with Vladimir Putin. And uh, um, I complained about the Russian missiles in the uh, Syrian border next door to our living rooms. And uh, uh, Mr. Putin looked at me and he said, well, Mr. Prime Minister, why are you so concerned? These are defensive missiles. If your planes will not be above Damascus, you will not meet my missiles. S somewhat later, I sat with him in Moscow, and he said to me, what does your friend think? talking about George W. Bush. He thinks that he can put missiles in the Czech Republic's border with Russia, in the Polish uh, uh, border with Russia. These were part of countries, part of the uh, Warsaw Pact. Now he wants to put American missiles over there? So I must say with a certain degree of arrogance, I looked at the president and they said, Mr. Putin, why are you so concerned? These are defensive missiles. If your planes will not be above Warsaw or above Prague, you will not meet the missiles. But then the president said to me something which I never forgot. He said, you tell your friend that Russia is a superpower and we can't be taken for granted. So now, you know, when you read about the, the most dramatic crisis in the history of the world since 1945, it was obviously the a Cuban Missile Crisis, because then the world was on the, almost on the verge of total destruction. And there were two leaders then, John Kennedy and Khrushchev, and now the books that you read 40 years, 50 years, when all the protocols are, are uh, public, you understand that both of them understood well in advance that there must be some kind of an understanding in order to protect the stability and the existence of the world. And subsequently, after the solution of this crisis, they started the rounds of uh, uh, agreements between America and Russia 
but the reduction of production of uh, nuclear missiles and so on and so forth. Now you ask me, what is the best possible solution? The best thing for the world is to have leaders who are responsible, emotionally balanced, and are working and living within the framework of a democratic system. Now, I don't know that I can say about the present situation, regardless of whether this is a two superpowers world or more divided, uh, whether the uh, leaders or the potential leaders of all the major powers meet these fundamental expectations that can make, uh, on the basis of leadership, a more stable and a more secured world. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure we would all love to listen to more stories and, and learn from your wisdom, but I think uh, we are going to wrap this conversation. The takeaways from, for me are that, that for the world to have fewer conflicts and to resolve the current ones, we need to build trust, listen to each other, and learn from history. Thank you very much for joining us here. And a big round of applause for our speakers here. Thank you.